with a recording career that spanned more than 50 years and alternately infused with country, blues, jazz, and rockabilly, for which he's become critically revered and widely covered by other musicians. John J.J. Kale was a singer, guitarist, songwriter, producer, and studio engineer who emerged from the 1950s rock and roll scene in Tulsa. Along with remaining popular in Europe since the 1970s, his American fans are intense diehards who eagerly awaited and supported each new project of his career. Born John Weldon Kale on December 5, 1938 in Oklahoma City to Lois and Elmer A. Kale, John was reared in Tulsa with his sister Joan Kale Summers, where he began playing a friend's guitar in the pre-rock era when Bob and Johnny Lee Will still held sway over Oklahoma's popular music scene. Yeah, well, I can remember before rock and roll, uh, around Oklahoma there, uh, Western Swing was real big. Bob Wills was uh, from Texas, but he headquartered out of Tulsa. I remember all the people that were my parents' age listened to that in a lot around Oklahoma. I started playing music professionally right a couple years before I got out of high school. Not professionally, but I started playing for, you know, money or I guess you might say, uh, fit around 54, 56. I got out of high school in 56. And uh, rhythm and blues was uh, kind of moving into the radio. As a teenager in Tulsa whose age collided perfectly with the first wave of classic rock and roll in the 1950s, he formed his own group, Johnny, Kale, and the Valentines, and played in clubs for $10 a night and all the beer you could drink, alongside Russell Bridges, later known as Leon Russell, before Kale moved to Nashville in 1959 and was hired by the Grand Old Opry's touring company. He returned to Tulsa after a few years, reunited with Leon Russell, and in 1964 moved to Los Angeles with Russell and Carl Radel. Once in Los Angeles, Kale fulfilled engineering duties for Leon Russell at Leon's home studio, where he met Snuff Garrett, who signed Kale to Viva Records in 1965, and who would also record Kale for Liberty Records. Kale's Viva album with fellow Oklahoman Roger Tillerson, Trip Down Sunset Strip, was released under the group name The Leather Coated Mines. The album, available as a reissue on Sundazed Records, became a curiosity to Kale that so many people were interested in it as it sounded dated to him by the 1980s. I was an engineer out in L.A. working as an engineer in a recording studio, which Warner Brothers eventually bought and called Amigo. A lot of hits have been cut out of there. In the uh, mid-60s, I was uh, played guitar at night in bar bands in Los Angeles, and in the daytime and sometimes even at night, I was a recording engineer for studio, that's how I made my living before I got famous for writing songs. Leon built a studio in his house, and I was engineering also for Leon part-time, you know, just kind of uh, moonlighting on about nine different gigs to pay my rent in L.A., you know, in the 60s. Kind of a, a, a cover album, cover tunes of the, of the psychedelic hits of the day. We lacked four songs, and so I wrote four instrumentals and tried to kind of put them in that bag. And uh, out of that, I had cut some more instrumentals that didn't make it to the album, and one of those instrumentals I happened to write some words to mm -hmm. that didn't get on the album, and that was the original recording after midnight. Mm -hmm. After midnight, we're going to let it all hang. After a trip to Nashville, Kale returned to Tulsa and signed with Leon Russell's Shelter Records in 1969. Kale was still putting his solo career together when he heard Clapton's version of After Midnight on a Tulsa radio station. The song was Kale's first hit as a songwriter and provided him with some much needed exposure and income from royalties. As a result of the success of After Midnight, J.J. released his first album, Naturally, in 1971, which provided the top 40 hit Crazy Mama, as well as his own version of After Midnight and Call Me the Breeze, later covered in a five-minute-plus version on Leonard Skinner's Mega Platinum Second Helping in 1974. Kale followed naturally with Really in 1972, which furthered his recording style of letting the soloing instruments be equal to his vocals on the tracks and produced the minor hit Lives. Kale continued his Oklahoma theme by naming his third album Oki in 1974 and also persisted in his lo-fi recording techniques by recording the title track on the back porch of his house in Tulsa. Oki also provided more inspiration for Leonard Skinner who recorded I Got the Same Old Blues Again on their Give Me Back My Bullets in 1976 with more royalties coming in from other people's versions of his songs, in 1975, Kale moved to Tennessee and bought a home in Hermitage, which was far enough outside of town so people wouldn't just drop by all the time. In 1976, Kale released Troubadour, featuring his last chart hit, Hey Baby, but more significantly included the would-be drug anthem, Cocaine, covered by Clapton on his 1977 album, Slow Hand. The entire album, Slow Hand, is a nod to J.J. Kale and the influence on Clapton's musical aesthetic of the time. Yeah, it makes me feel good because, yeah, I mean, that's, I've been, 
I think I got the music business not only because it's fun to play, mm -hmm. but I love to play the guitar and I love to be around musicians. I love music and I love all kinds of music and like to be in that quote scene, you know. Mm -hmm. When those guys just started doing my, uh, started uh, doing what it was I was doing, my songs, mm -hmm. or, you know, and barring some of my influences or things. Yeah, it really made me feel good. Hale's next album, 1979's Five, featured appearances by old friends Carl Radel on bass and Jimmy Karstein, who's played drums on practically every J.J. Kale session and show since the early 1970s, along with his guitarist and wife, Christine Lakeland, on vocals and various instruments. Lakeland, originally from Kalamazoo, Michigan, met J.J. at a prison benefit show in Nashville after she'd just come off the road playing with Merle Haggard. Kale hired her for his band, and Lakeland stayed with him from that point forward. In 1980, Kale left Nashville and returned to California, where he promptly sold what he did not want, packed the rest into a gleaming Airstream trailer, and moved into an Anaheim trailer park, where he was notoriously reclusive. Kale released his final Shelter album, Shades, in 1981, to very little fanfare, although it had songs with his subtle humor, I wish I'd not said that, and his penchant for straight-ahead back porch jams on Mama Don't. 1982's album, Grasshopper, found success in Europe, but not in the U.S., and 1983's album, Number 8, became his first to not chart at all. After more than 25 years of playing and recording music, J.J. stepped away from the recording industry. During his six-year release hiatus, Kale recorded songs that finally emerged in 1989 on Travelogue, an album that featured Hoyt Axton on backing vocals, James Burton on one track, and longtime drummer and fellow Oklahoman Jimmy Karstein. Closer to You garnered the same cultish admiration from longtime Kale devotees as did his 1996 release, Guitar Man. Mercury released two best of compilations in 1997 and 98, Anyway the Wind Blows, Anthology, and the very best of J.J. Kale. In 2001, Kale released his first live album, Live, recorded at Carnegie Hall and other venues around the U.S. and Germany. Also in 2002, Classic Pictures released a DVD of a 1979 Kale performance with Leon Russell in the band as J.J. Kale, The Lost Session. In June of 2003, Kale returned to Tulsa to record for an album that became To Tulsa and Back. Recorded at his friend David T. Garden's Natura Studios near Beggs, Oklahoma, the album included what amounted to a reunion of Kale's old Tulsa buddies. Kale toured for only the second time since 1996 to support the album. JJ's 2004 concerts were frequently sold out and chronicled by German director Jörg Bunschu for the 2008 film To Tulsa and Back on tour with JJ Kale. Kale's 16th studio album, Roll On, released in 2009, featured him assuming the versatile jack of all trades role as he had on many previous projects, playing guitars, bass, drums, synthesizers, and singing, as well as producing and engineering the whole album. Rolling Stone described the music as supremely chill, utterly ageless. Many of his friends say J.J. may have actually been more enthusiastic about engineering and producing than anything else. Working with his longtime manager Mike Kappas, the two collaborated on three John Hammond CDs, all of which were Grammy nominated. Even though Kale received great recognition from his contemporaries and, as time went on, other rising stars, his nature was to always avoid the spotlight. Over the years, he declined many offers for awards and honors he clearly deserved. After Kale's passing on July 26, 2013, Eric Clapton gathered a group of like-minded friends and musicians for The Breeze, an appreciation of J.J. Kale, released in July 2014. Clapton also produced a behind-the-scenes documentary for the tribute. Also in 2014, the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame reiterated their long-standing offer to induct Kale. Feeling that Kale's legacy certainly deserved recognition in the hall, his family accepted the invitation in his honor. While Kale was uncomfortable with public acclaim and attention, his family is sure he would have appreciated the respect and admiration he continues to receive from his peers, his longtime fans, and new generations still discovering his music. Kale enjoyed being the person who focused on the crafts of writing, engineering, and production rather than the pursuit of commercial success. For these reasons, as well as his influence on so many musicians and the sound of popular music from the 1960s through the 2000s and beyond, John J.J. Kale was inducted into the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. Things worked out good.